Well, uh, hello everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Matt Rochansky, director of the Kennan Institute. Uh, very pleased to be able to bring you uh, a follow-up discussion on uh, Russia and the COVID-19 uh, response with a really wonderful panel, um, a diverse set of experiences and views for what is obviously a fast-moving topic, um, but certainly one that has been in the news in the last several days. As many of you know, uh, Russia is now number two in the world for total number of cases, uh, with the case numbers growing very, very fast uh, in the uh, uh, five digits now, daily over 10,000 new cases each day. Um, we hope everybody is staying safe and uh, socially distant, if that is your uh, response and, uh, and, and healthy and engaged. And uh, we hope that this conversation will be an opportunity for that. Um, you can stay up to date uh, on all of the Kennan Institute's work, uh, including our latest episode of the Kennan X podcast, which will be about COVID in Russia, available very soon, uh, and the forthcoming launch of our new podcast, uh, generated in the Petri dish, sorry, too soon, of social isolation called the Russia File Podcast. Um, so please uh, pay attention uh, for both of those. If you're on our email list, uh, they'll be sent out to you soon. If you're not, please join us. Um, uh, our panel, as you likely know from the announcement, uh, includes uh, Dr. Judy Twig, Dr. Robert Heimer, uh, and Sergei Parkomenko uh, of the Kennan Institute. All have uh, invaluable experience and a lot to share on this topic from different perspectives. Um, but before I introduce uh, each of them in sequence and open the conversation, I just want to take a moment to remember uh, a, a just an incredible uh, person who departed us recently, Dr. Ed Berger. Uh, for those of you who know the field of U.S.-Russia health cooperation, uh, you will not be a stranger to the work of Dr. Berger and uh, the Eurasian uh, medical education program that he founded and ran for some two decades. Um, he was just an amazing man. Uh, he was, of course, a medical doctor, uh, also had a doctor of science degree, uh, served in uh, the Navy, uh, in uh, the Naval Health Service, served on the staff of the President's Science Advisor, uh, was a professor at Georgetown Medical School, and just fundamentally a, a leading player in starting and then expanding U.S. Soviet and U.S. Russian health cooperation. We lost him. Uh, last month from heart failure. Uh, there's a very uh, touching op-ed, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 obituary uh, that you can find on the internet uh, if you just Google his name. Um, and I feel especially close to Ed, not only because of our work together over the years, uh, but because uh, he also spent a lot of his time in Vermont uh, where he had uh, restored and preserved a historic farm. And uh, that's where my wife's family is from. And we too uh, enjoy Vermont whenever we can. Um, so the next time we go up there, and, and indeed whenever that is, and the time before then, we'll all be thinking of it. Uh, and if we could just take a, a brief moment now in this format uh, to, to remember him silently. Thank you. Um, now I want to proceed to introduce our panel. Uh, I think uh, you'll, you'll see from their longer bios available on the internet that they really are uh, deep experts in their respective areas of this topic. Uh, I'm going to introduce them each before they speak. Uh, all throughout, you'll be able to pose questions simply by emailing kennan at wilsoncenter.org, uh, tweeting at Kennan Institute, or via our Facebook page. And please, when you ask a question, include your name and your affiliation. If you have one, that will get us as close as possible to the uh, normal, lively dinner table conversation format that we seek to achieve in these events. Now, I'm going to begin with Dr. Judy Twig, who's a professor of political science at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, her work, as will be well known to many of you, I think, focuses on uh, health, demographic change, and health systems reform in Russia as well as evaluations of health reform, communicable disease control, and education reform projects. Uh, she currently directs the Eurasia Health Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and she co-chairs the Public Health Working Group and the Overall Steering Committee for the U.S.-Russia Social Expertise Exchange Program administered by the Eurasia Foundation. So, Judy, why don't you start us out? 
Thanks very much, Matt. And uh, before we begin, I want to say an additional couple of words about Dr. Ed Berger and offer my condolences to, uh, to his family and to his loved ones. He, uh, he was quite a mentor to me uh, over the years and really taught all of us how to do professional, scientific, and medical partnerships with, uh, with respect for, for our partners on both sides. So it's a tremendous loss to, uh, to our community. Um, and we miss his work now in, in the middle of this pandemic. So let me offer just a few remarks of uh, thinking about some of the things that he might have taught us uh, about how Russia is handling uh, COVID-19. Um, as Matt already said, Russia's position on the global leaderboard for coronavirus has increased significantly over the last two weeks. Uh, along with Brazil, Russia now has one of the sets of numbers that's rising fastest in a major country. Um, they've averaged about 10,000 new cases a day uh, for well over a week. Uh, they now have about 242,000 total reported cases. And that puts, as of today, Russia as the number two uh, largest number of reported cases in the world. Uh, behind the United States. There are still lots of questions around Russia's basic numbers, and Robert will discuss uh, these more in his presentation, but um, just to make some notes, there, there are large numbers of tests performed in Russia, about six million reported tests, uh, but there are issues around the accuracy of those tests. Um, the mayor of Moscow, uh, Sobyanin, has directly stated that Moscow's numbers are a huge undercount because of issues with testing. There are also relatively few deaths reported, a remarkably low case fatality rate in Russia compared with other countries. Um, it's likely that many deaths are being coded um, as other causes rather than from COVID-19. Um, we'll over, only have a better understanding of this really emerge as we're able to compare the total number of deaths from various causes this year uh, with comparable time periods in, in preceding years. There are also issues around incentives to report cases of COVID-19 and deaths from COVID-19 in Russia. It's a political system where nobody wants to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, and so it's unlikely that they're deliberately covering up the number of cases or the number of deaths in some insidious, deliberate manner. It's more likely that there are just political and bureaucratic incentive structures that discourage reporting what's really going on. Um, I'd like to go in my remarks though beyond the basic parameters of the pandemic in Russia and instead raise some issues of what we don't yet completely know about the broader situation. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the effectiveness of the healthcare response. Um, overall, health workers are very rightly being viewed in the media and by the general public as heroic figures, and, and indeed they are. Uh, and it's clear that the healthcare system overall hasn't been as overwhelmed as we had originally feared it might be. Certainly there have been some instances of temporary localized overload on the system, but in general, it looks like there's been enough surge capacity. Um, there have been enough beds. They've been converting hospitals to COVID-19 only facilities. They've been building more facilities. Uh, there have been enough ventilators. There have been enough other equipment, but certainly some key issues have emerged. Uh, the largest of those issues so far has been around personal protective equipment. There are shortages of PPE everywhere in Russia. In normal times before the crisis, personal protective equipment in Russia was mostly imported from China. You could get it so cheaply from there that it didn't make sense to manufacture it on a mass production basis in Russia. So in January and February of this year, when China got hit hard with the pandemic and production of PPE in China slowed down, Russia actually sold a lot of the PPE that it had back to China. So that left Russia with big shortages when Russia got hit. Uh, now manufacture and purchase of PPE in Russia is centralized in the Ministry of Industry and Trade. And Russia is buying from China again. And there are loans to Russian companies to ramp up PPE production in a major way. But it's hard. In order to ramp up that production in Russia, they need production equipment that's made in China and in Western Europe. And everyone in the world is trying to buy that equipment right now to ramp up production. So there's lots of competition to get uh, not just the PPE itself, but the industrial equipment that you need to make the PPE. Um, we also have stories that when large batches of PPE are becoming available on the market, some large Russian enterprises have been buying them for themselves, hoarding them for their workers. So there are shortages. The good news is that there are lots of charity funds that are collecting money to buy PPE. 
Uh, there are some hospitals that are being supported by the local enterprises in their area. But overall, it's hospitals that are getting hit. Um, head doctors in hospitals are often afraid to formally ask for PPE. They're reluctant to admit that they have shortages. Again, they don't wanna be the bearers of bad news. And the bottom line is that because of these PPE shortages, health workers have been highly vulnerable to infection. Hospitals themselves have become one of the primary hotspots of infection in the country, and many health workers themselves have become infected and have died. Uh, the big story last week coming out of Russia was about several doctors falling to their deaths out of hospital windows. Um, I don't think that this was anything specifically insidious. I don't think the Kremlin is deliberately silencing doctors who are speaking out against their working conditions or, or against shortages of PPE. Uh, it's much more likely that what we're seeing here are suicides among healthcare workers. Um, Russia's not unique here, uh, but there is widespread despair among doctors and healthcare workers about their lack of personal protective equipment, about their inability to save their patients, about pressure from local bureaucracies to produce results in a situation where producing results is so difficult and impossible in, in many circumstances. As the pandemic has developed, they separated hospitals into those that are treating COVID-19 and those that are not, or they're uh, separating into red and green zones within single facilities, and that's good for infection control. But within the health system, what that means is that resources are overwhelmingly being shifted toward the fight against COVID-19. That's magnifying challenges and shortages in the rest of the healthcare system. In many cases, those challenges and shortages already existed in the healthcare system. Uh, so we're hearing stories like one heartbreaking one uh, from Tula last week, where the pediatrician who couldn't even get those disposable wood popsicle stick like tongue depressors for examining his kids' throats. So he had to start using metal ones and boil them after each use uh, in order for them to be sterilized. That kind of story of shortage uh, is, is becoming increasingly common. Uh, we're also hearing lots of stories about shortages of medical personnel as health workers have become sick and therefore taken out of the work space um, as they've passed away. Um, we know that Russia has mobilized thousands of medical students to come out of medical school and start practicing early. And we've also seen hospitals going on social media asking for an anesthesiologist, uh, resuscitation specialist, uh, the particular specialists that they need uh, to come and, and work in their facilities. And one obvious question that's come up just over the last couple of days is about the ventilators. Uh, we all worried about ventilator shortages or the quality of ventilators in Russia at the beginning of pandemic. Uh, and now we're hearing in the last couple of days reports of fires in hospitals in Moscow and St. Petersburg caused by electrical shorts in faulty ventilators that were produced in Russia. Uh, it looks like it's one specific model coming out of one specific factory. And I'll note that that model was one of the ones that was shipped as part of the Russian aid delivery to the United States. So those faulty ventilators have been in New York and New Jersey. Uh, but they have not been used in hospitals. Uh, New York and New Jersey have reported actually that they haven't needed those Russian produced ventilators and they've been sent back to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So uh, we, we don't worry about those uh, equipment failures here in the United States. Um, another factor with health workers is that we know that the payment of additional wages and bonus to that were promised to healthcare workers haven't materialized everywhere as they were promised. Uh, there are also supposed to be large payments to families of healthcare workers who have died of COVID-19, basically insurance payments. And we're learning now that those aren't getting paid consistently. And we're worrying that that's actually acting as an incentive not to put the cause of death of a healthcare worker as COVID-19 so that the state doesn't have to make those large insurance payments to the families of those health workers that have died. So that's some remarks about uh, what's happening with the broader healthcare system. I think there are a couple of other areas of impact that we should just uh, put on the table to address. One obviously is the political impact. It's interesting that Putin is not getting the kind of rally around the flag uh, popularity boost that many other world leaders have seen, um, like, like Macron in France, uh, Andrew Cuomo in New York. Um, overall, there's a perception, I think, that Putin has been a surprisingly weak 
passive figure uh, throughout the crisis. Uh, it seems that his strategy has been to sit back and let the governor take responsibility for, for what happens, and that maybe that strategy has backfired. Uh, Putin wanted to be able to blame somebody else uh, if things go wrong, but instead he's being increasingly perceived as having abdicated his position of leadership. Um, people in Russia aren't happy with the lockdown. They're not understanding what's driving the decisions about lockdowns in Moscow and around the rest of the country. Um, a common joke over the last couple of days as the period of non-working days has been lifted and, and the economy is opening up again, people are joking that, hey, when we had 1,000 new cases a day, they put us on lockdown. Now that we have 10,000 new cases a day, they're sending us back to work again. And, uh, and people aren't understanding what's driving those decisions. Um, Public opinion polls show approval and trust ratings rising for some governors. And I know Sergei's gonna talk about center region relations in additional detail, but I'd wanna make three quick points here. Um, one is there's a remarkable dynamic going on in the North Caucasus region of Russia, um, where in Chechnya, um, the uh, Kadyrov put a total lockdown in place, but in other regions like Ingushetia, Dagestan, the trust of the government is so low that people don't believe there's an epidemic. And so they're not practicing physical distancing, they're not wearing masks, they're not following the basic public health recommendations of, of the government. That lack of trust is leading to uh, outbreaks of the epidemic. Um, a second point has to do with the remarkable anti-Moscow sentiment we're seeing around the country. Um, people in the regions where there are outbreaks are looking for the specific individuals, the, the fall guys, the scapegoats, the people to blame for the spread of the virus. You know, which rich guy flew here from Moscow and brought coronavirus with him into our region? Um, and, and that's adding to a resentment that people in the regions have about their economies and their societies being under lockdown uh, under those orders because of, of a pandemic that they see as still primarily centered in, in Moscow. Why are we suffering because of things that are happening in Moscow? And then lastly, in the regions, it's not a surprise that in many cases we're seeing local oligarchs running much of the show. Uh, oligarchs are financing the building of new hospital capacity. They're buying PPE. They're coordinating the lockdowns and the emergency relief efforts. So, you know, a real signal of, of where where power and authority lies in the, uh, in the country. Um, the last uh, question I'll raise is about what the social impact of the pandemic has been in Russia. Um, those questions about the social impact, I think emerge when we start to look behind just the overall case numbers and the overall mortality numbers and start to ask who these people are, who is it that's getting sick and, and dying? What's their socioeconomic profile? What have been the primary risk factors for infection and for uh, severe infection and death? We know that the early infections were among relatively wealthy people in Russia, people who had been on holiday in Italy, uh, Spain, on ski vacations. But I think it's high time that we started to think about the impact of infection now on more vulnerable groups, uh, figuring out how the disease has spread among more marginalized populations. Um, and one particular population I think that we're going to start hearing more about over time are labor migrants. Uh, there are millions of undocumented labor migrants in Russia from Central Asia, from the Caucasus, living in crowded, miserable conditions in Moscow, other major cities, uh, and they've been continuing to work in a lot of cases, obviously hugely vulnerable to infection. We saw the impact of that in Singapore just a couple of weeks ago, where there was a surge of infections in one particular dormitory housing migrant workers, um, so that, that's worthy of, of keeping an eye on in Russia. And then lastly, I think beyond the spread of coronavirus itself, it's important to think about the broader health and social impact. And just two points I'll make there. One is that there's lots of non-coronavirus related healthcare that's being neglected right now. People with chronic health conditions, non-communicable disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, not only do those things make a person more likely to contract a serious case of COVID-19 disease, but those people are likely afraid to go to the doctor right now. They're not keeping up with management of their conditions. Um, what about things like just routine immunization, cancer screenings, regular healthcare? In the United States, there's been a 50%, 50 percent, five zero percent reduction in visits to primary care physicians 
over the last eight weeks. Um, so this is a way that the pandemic of coronavirus could reverberate throughout the entire health sector. And then lastly, we should ask about the specific impact of this pandemic on women. Um, in Russia, we're hearing that there has been a doubling of domestic violence complaints under lockdown. Women are trapped at home with their abusers. Um, the shelters that they might go to, the other support services that they might rely on have had their services curtailed or closed. Um, so just one example of the kinds of social impacts that we should start paying attention to with the, uh, with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, I want to go right to Sergey, uh, who will talk to us a little bit more about some of the topics that you raised, uh, including uh, politically sensitive issues and social payments and center region dynamics, which I think is probably an under uh, an undernoticed aspect of, of this situation in Russia, at least uh, from the from the outside, from the West. Um, Sergey Parchomenko, the the incomparable. Uh, and well-known Russian journalist, uh, publisher, and founder of a number of important social projects aimed at developing civic activism, promoting liberal values, and of course, supporting independent journalism, uh, is a, our senior advisor at the Kennan Institute. Um, and since August of 2003, has been presenting uh, his uh, very widely listened to Suit Sobiti, uh, the heart, uh, the crux of the matter uh, radio program on FO of Moscow. Uh, a, a weekly program which looks at the events of the past week, but we get to hear from Sergey today in the middle of the week. So, Sergey, please. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me uh, here. I totally agree with that Judy said uh, about Putin, and um, uh, Putin is really being very passive and really avoiding taking difficult decisions now on the coronavirus period. And uh, lots of Russian joke about it, that we don't have state of emergency in Russia. We have what the hell knows what state. Uh, it's a much ruder expression used in Russian, but I translate it in that, that way. Uh, uh, really, uh, two days ago, last Monday, Putin's deliver Putin delivered a statement for the fifth time fifth time to the entire population. But let's note that he never speaks di directly to Russian citizens. It is not his style. He, his address are always organized as if Putin were taking a meeting with the government or the governors of Russian regions or some other responsible bureaucrats. Uh, and he addressed the people as if through their heads. So after this speech of this Monday, just, just primitive thing, no one understood that Putin said about the future strategy to fight the epidemic in Russia in this, uh, in this stage. Uh, there are still now debate in Russian social, social media and Russian press about what he said exactly, because in his speech, some parts were completely contradictory to others. In one phrase, he said that all Russian, all Russian enterprises are back to operation. And another phrase, he said the opening of the factories, offices, and state organizations is completely dependent on the governors, governors of local administration. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important factor in the current situation. Uh, in Russia, we're seeing a strange process of, I said, forced federalization. The Kremlin administration systematically shifts responsibility for decision on the epidemic to regional authorities, governors, and city mayors. This is a very unusual process in Russia because the Russian Federation, you know, the Russian Federation, unlike, unlike the United States, has never really been a federation. It's a unitary state. More than that, it's a super unitary state. And uh, uh, this shift of power, it's uh, not the authority, not the resource, not the money, not, uh, uh, not uh, the, some, possibility, some possibility to, to uh, 
to this governance, but only responsibility is transferred from the center to the region. That's it's, it's important. This ad hoc federalism is precisely the flight of Putin and his entourage from res responsibility. That's it's very easy. If the wall epidemic story and well, all the merit will go to Putin. If the situation turns tragically, governance and regional administration will be responsible. That's all. It's it's so primitive. It's so flat. It's so understandable. Uh, but mm, it's always the regional administra administrators and uh, regional governors are obliged to impose, to, 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 to impose difficult things, all restrictions, uh, all uh, business uh, who shutting down, or forbidden, forbidding the people to go out and oblige them to wear masks under the threat of huge fines. All this is a work for local administrations. And for Putin, only good news. Only good news comes from Putin. Uh, he only allows, opens, encourages, and promises some 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 new possibility and some new good things uh, uh, and the state state help. Uh, it's I think it's something opposite to that that what's happening in the in the United States now. Putin artificially artificially make the governors. Uh, to make decision in his place. But it's very important that these people, they were, they were the, the huge majority of uh, Russian regional governments and Myers have never been mm, designed, have never been imagined, to, have never been uh, nominated to make any decision. In general, Putin, Putin's entire system of power, the famous vertical of power, has been designed not to share power with local administration, but opposite thing to concentrate it in, in Kremlin. And this Putin, it is Putin's uh, employee, this Putin's apprentice uh, on the on the regions, uh, everybody was appointed by Putin, and Putin, and among them. We see many small technocrats from Putin administration who have no connection with local uh, local elite, with, with local uh, local people in power, local influential people, no authority with the local population, and they have never been elected in a real free alternative election. They used a huge administrative resource, huge special possibility uh, that Moscow uh, gave to him. And the population now doesn't trust him. And the population does not know them and does not understand the logic of their action. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a lack of power in Russia because Putin refused to, 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 to make the difficult decision, and the governors are obliged to, to, to make the difficult decisions without any support, without any uh, um, compensation, and uh, without, without, um, uh, without uh, any contact with, with, local, with local population. The second uh, uh, the second important thing is uh, that during this coronavirus period, is we have the almost complete absence of state assistance to business and entrepreneurs in Russia. Uh, even information about the real situation in the economy in Russia remain practically unknown. In the United States, the most important factor and the most important uh, number is the number of unemployed people. And in particular, the number of people who have applied for unemployment every week. Uh, no such information in Russia. It's virtually no official unemployment amount, an unemployment number in Russia. No one is collection 
the true information about people who have actually lost their jobs now in Russia. Russia have a re relatively big uh, reserve uh, national welfare fund. It's uh, uh, in this fund uh, during last uh, 15 years uh, come the additional revenues from oil and gas trade uh, during the period when price was very high. Now this fund have almost 13 trillion rubles. Uh, uh, the rate of dollar is uh, more or less 75 rubles now, so you can imagine this, this amount in uh, US dollars. And it's quite obvious that Putin is trying to save this money, not to spend it now, maybe not to spend it at all, because he has yet to organize a vote, very important, what may be the crucial vote, maybe the most important vote in, in his uh, uh, political career, the vote uh, on constitutional amendments, which he initiated this spring. And the main amendment uh, is his, Putin's right to effectively hold the presidency forever. Uh, the voting, the popular voting, was uh, scheduled for early April, and it was cancelled the last minute. And it's, it's clear now that Putin wants to return to this issue uh, in mid-summer. Nobody in Kremlin, no Putin, no his cronies, no governors, nobody uh, Tan, uh, nobody forgot this, this, this issue and this, this problem. It, it is very likely that he, Putin, wants to retain the opportunity to, to have a wide distribution of money just before the vote to, uh, to this, for, this, uh, uh, for these amendments, actually for just by the waters. In fact, uh, it's just this Monday, during this fifth uh, address to the population, Putin promised some direct small financial assistance to the, to the population for the first time. It was assistance, it will be provided to family with children under six, 16 years old. The total amount of this assistance is about 200 billion rubles. It's approximately four billion dollars. Four billion dollars for all the huge Russia, just compare it to the amount of support that the United States government is paying for American business. In a previous st statement, two, two weeks ago, Putin started talking about business assistance, but it's also about tiny amount of money. Just, just minimum. It's about 80 billion rubles in total. That's a little bit more than one billion dollars. It's absolutely nothing. It's 0.3 percent of the Russian GDP. No more. So uh, that's the two important things: the transfer of responsibility, not the power, but responsibility, from Kremlin to regional uh, uh, powers, to regional governors, and uh, in fact, the absence of state support to national business. Just die. The, 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 the message of Kremlin, the message of, uh, of, uh, the message of Putin to, to Russian business is you must die. And uh, we will see after. Maybe we will grow another business and another businessman. Maybe we will nationalize uh, all your businesses. Maybe we will, we will decide, decide something. But now we have to work without any support, without any transfers, without any assistance from 
state money from state uh, financial system and from state reserves. That's all for me. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Sergey. Uh, under those circumstances, is it any surprise that some businesses are hoarding uh, PPE when they come across them? They're on their own and they're doing what they can. Um, I'm surprised to find myself defending Russian business. Uh, before I go to Dr. Heimer, uh, I want to remind those listening, I understand um, there may have been a delay in getting this event up on the website, so you may not have heard that to ask a question, email kenan at wilsoncenter.org, tweet to at Kenan Institute, or post on our Facebook page, and simply please include your name and affiliation when you send your questions. All right, now, uh, last but not least, to give us a sense of the scope of the epidemic itself, um, the question of accuracy of numbers and eff efficacy of testing, and uh, this sort of um, perplexingly low death rate we keep hearing about, and some of the strange, almost conspiratorial explanations I've, I've heard for that. Um, Dr. Robert Heimer, who is a professor of epidemiology, uh, microbial diseases, and pharmacology at the Yale School of Medicine, uh, his major research efforts include scientific investigation of the mortality and morbidity associated with injection drug use. Uh, he is a member of Yale's Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS and is former director of its Interdisciplinary Research Methods Corps. So, Dr. Heimer, please, those and, and any other questions you'd like to cover. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present to your, your audience this morning, um, or wherever you are, if it's not morning. Um, the one thing that strikes me, my, my experience in Russia has been almost entirely related to the epidemic, the conjoined epidemic of, of addiction and HIV and related diseases. And the one thing that struck me then and strikes me now in this new massive catastrophic health threat to Russia and the United States are the parallels between our two countries. Uh, Sergei was talking about the abdication of responsibility by uh, you know, the, the, the leader of, of Russia, Putin. We see exactly the same thing in the United States, that, that leadership has to devolve down to the states, uh, uh, to, the, to the oblasts. It, it's the same thing um, all over again. I, I, and I, you know, my sense of history leads me to believe that Russia and the United States are two countries in some ways separated at birth, that the historical parallels between the two countries are absolutely striking in, in terms of when things happen um, everywhere. And I think with the possible exception of the freeing of the slaves versus the serfs, um, the United States has always been at least a few years or a few months or a few weeks ahead of Russia. And that seems to be exactly the same case here with the, the, the COVID-19 epidemic, that we're seeing uh, a delay in Russia that um, really is, um, is strikingly familiar. Um, the, you know, the epidemic in both our countries will be controlled uh, when three or four things are in place. Um, we've already mentioned uh, the personal protective equipment, we sort of touched a little bit on testing. We have not touched at all yet on contact tracing. And we've touched a little bit when, it, when we're talking about the distrust in government, again, a common feature in both countries, is to the willingness of the populace to engage in the kind of social distancing and um, safe behaviors uh, that are going to keep people from infecting each other at, at rapid, at high rates. Um, so when it comes to, let's start with PPE, I, I, I don't know enough about the actual situation to, 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 to tell you much. Uh, again, let's, so I, I, I'll leave that discussion to what we've already covered. When it comes to testing, again, there seems to be a, uh, no centralized effort to produce tests that I'm aware of, uh, either in the U.S. or, or in Russia. Again, a, a striking parallel uh, that many of the tests may, in fact, be inaccurate. 
Um, and if it's similar to the United States, then the tests will be relatively um, sensitive in that if you test positive, you're likely to be positive, but to have a low specificity, meaning that you're going to miss a lot of the cases. Um, and I think that's I think that's probably the case in Russia, and why uh, the mayor of Moscow has said that uh, you know we're we're, we're undercounting, and why we're pro they're probably undercounting in many other parts of the of the country as well as these tests are are going to be inaccurate and and under under identifying positives. In terms of contact tracing, I haven't heard of any efforts to set up the kind of surveillance, active surveillance system. This is, an, this is not uh, anything that Russia has ever done uh, that I'm aware of. Um, the health system sort of seems to require that people come in and be diagnosed, and Russia's very good at counting things. But Russia, you know, as the health system and the public health system, which is almost non-existent as a as a proactive force, um, to to go out and identify and do the necessary contact tracing and and enforce quarantining and isolation would be necessary to control a, an epidemic of of a communicable infectious disease. Uh, the Last issue is the willingness of individuals to adhere to standards of so, uh, you know, spatial distancing, uh, self-isolation, uh, remaining at home unless it's absolutely necessary, not going out in groups. Uh, again, the parallels between um, the US and Russia, the distrust of government, uh, on the parts of many, many segments of the population, although those segments differ in Russia and the US, um, you know, is going to make it very, very hard to clamp down on this, on this problem. And even in places like Germany and um, Korea, where people have been, you know, fairly adherent to, uh, you know, such, such personal, changing personal behaviors, we're still seeing you know, sporadic reemergence of this of these infections, and in the absence of a really thorough population-wide self-protective set of behavior changes, we are not going to see this epidemic end anytime soon. The last issue that's been raised briefly, and I don't want to go on too long about this, so we can leave time for questions, is the issue of of deaths and and what might be the a at a possible explanation for why the percentage of cases that lead to a a, a, die, a death, uh, you know, you know, COVID as the cause of death is only one percent in Russia, you know, while it's five percent in China, six percent in the U.S., above ten percent in places like Spain and Italy, um, is my my experiences with the HIV epidemic, where large numbers of people who died of AIDS-related complications, uh, the death the the cause of death was not attributed to HIV or AIDS, but to the the, the tuberculosis or the pneumonia or or whatever other form of viral disease or bacterial disease or fungal disease eventually claimed their, you know, their lives, at, you know, when they became fully immunocompromised. I think the same thing may be true here, that people are being diagnosed and they may have COVID-19 or, or SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis somewhere in their medical record, but they're being written up as having died of the pneumonia or one of the other uh, you know, more minor causes of, of death that, that seem to be a feature, especially in older people, of, uh, of, a, of a rapidly advancing unchecked uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So uh, again, I, I don't think it's a, a conspiracy of any kind. I think it's just a, a systematic issue that's pervasive in Russia and has been, you know, for the, the, the 20 plus years that I've been doing work there. I don't see the system having changed in any way to um, be able to 
properly account for the true toll of this epidemic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Heimer, and, and thank you all. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, uh, and we have a great many questions. So uh, I think what I'll do is uh, hold some of the follow-ups that I had. Uh, I want to go right uh, to questions that have been submitted by the audience. And I think in the interest of time, uh, I will direct the question to an individual. And if someone else wants to chime in, uh, just uh, signal to me. Um, this is a question first for Sergey, and it comes from the co-chair of the Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council and former head of MI6, uh, Sir John Scarlett, uh, who asks, Putin must be aware of the increasingly open criticism uh, that he is abdicating from management of the crisis. Do you think that his approach and policy might change in light of that? And if it does, uh, the risk to the referendum result would seem obvious, although I, I think uh, we don't know when the referendum or how the referendum will be hold, held yet, uh, if I understand that correctly. Sergey, please. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about this referendum, about, uh, uh, about uh, constitution amendments. And uh, I think uh, that's, the, that's the major risk for, for Putin's now, because uh, he uh, has to has to operate in this small window of possibility uh, before the moment, just after the moment, then uh, population will be grateful and the population will be, uh, will be happy uh, with uh, the state support. And at the another moment, will population will realize that the uh, effect of uh, epidemic, uh, firstly, the, the effect of, of Russian economy is uh, really catastrophe. So, so it's, 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 to, it's to, to choose a very uh, precise moment for this, for this, this referendum. And uh, it, 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 is a, it is a great risk for, for Putin because before this epidemic, all Always was absolutely clear. Always was absolutely guaranteed for Putin. Always was uh, absolutely uh, decided for Putin just before the the starting of war, because uh, the the rating of of uh, Putin's support was uh, absolutely enormous. Now it's it's not the same situation at all. And uh, it's uh, maybe the first time on the Putin's political career that he have to react to to situation he what which develops without decision without decision of Putin. And we see uh, his uh, capacity of reaction is very very limited. We, we see this this Putin who 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 was afraid that by 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 by, by this situation. Uh, so uh, it will be maybe the crucial moment this uh, this summer and this uh, autumn, uh, just on the on the next period of of Russian um, uh, uh, Russian epidemic epidemic. And in this time, maybe Russia will be at the at the first place, the the first suffering uh, nation uh, at the world because the development of of uh, this epidemic is really, really dangerous and very catastrophic in Russia. Thanks. Uh, I, want to, I want to go to Judy with this question from Ambassador uh, William Courtney, who asks uh, what the potential in Russia is uh, for civil society to fill some of the gaps that you've identified. Um, for example, uh, just helping you do public education, providing volunteer assistance, uh, mobilizing uh, perhaps some popular political support for more spending on health. And I'm recalling here some of the, the recent uh, episodes, like, for example, the fires uh, a decade ago, where civil society really came out of the woodwork and just did incredible work to compensate for the inadequate response to the Russian emergency services. Judy, what do you think about that? We're already seeing that happen in, uh, in, in a major way. This is what civil society does in Russia. It steps up when there are gaps left, crack, cracks in the system, um, 
you know, they, they step in and keep people from falling through those cracks. And so we're already seeing, as we've seen in many places around the world, um, individuals and civil society organizations stepping up with manufacture and distribution of PPE. Uh, we're seeing delivery of meals to healthcare workers. Uh, a, a wide variety of social activism uh, is already very much in place and growing to, to try to keep the keep the fabric of society uh, together when, as Sergei has pointed out, the state has very much abdicated its responsibility to, uh, to maintain those gaps in the safety net during a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Heimer, I want to go to you with this question from uh, Professor Amaryllis uh, Lugo de Fabrics from Howard University. She asks, uh, given how little is known about how the virus affects overall health, uh, how do you think we'll be able to carry out productive comparative analysis of the effects of the pandemic on different population groups for international comparison? For example, in cities in the United States, there are disproportionate numbers of infection among African American populations and radically different rates of infection depending on population density. Well, that's that, you know, that's the, that's a, a, a main major question that you know um, I think everyone is trying to to get their hands around um, and I, I'm not sure I have a, a really cogent answer to that because in some ways she answers her own question in that we we understand that in different contexts there are going to be different vulnerable po populations that the things that seem to um, you know predict which population is going to be most at risk are those populations that already are under social stress due to disparities, um, due to the history of oppression, due to uh, structural issues that put their commute, that weakens their the very fabric of their communities. And so I think we're going to see, um, we've already seen the effect in in weakened communities in the United States, whether it's the aged, whether it's African Americans, whether it's people working in, in close quarters, in, 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 in meatpacking plants. I think we're gonna see the same thing in Russia, that the, the migrant community that's forced to live together in substandard housing is gonna be at tremendous risk. Uh, the elderly are gonna be at tremendous risk. Um, those people, when the disease eventually, when the virus eventually gets there, poor rural communities um, are going to be, you know, uh, are going to be hard hit because the disease is going to run through some of the villages and hamlets and there's going to be no way to, to track it in time to stop it. Uh, and I think it's just a question of, um, trying to I think it's too late to change that because these are these are in inherent structural issues these are not easily rectifiable vulnerable factors so we're not gonna we're not this is not something that that we're going to be able to control it's something that maybe in, in the future um, if we can change our systems of doing things if we can have a a healthcare system that's more proactive, if we can change some of the underlying structural problems in our communities, if we can create safer, healthier communities, you know, but that's, that's not going to happen in time to prevent this from being catastrophic in, in many parts of the world, not just Russia and the United States, but in many parts of the world, we're already seeing it in Brazil and in India and in South Africa is now experiencing a, a very large and growing epidemic. This is not, this is, you know, we, you know, we're, we're going to be watching this. We're not going to be affecting it in any meaningful way in the near future. I'm sorry to say. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, we've got just five minutes left, and I want to get through a number of other questions. So uh, let me ask you to keep your answers short, and I'll go to Sergey uh, with two related questions, asking you, Sergey, to uh, put yourself in the in the mind of the Kremlin leadership. Uh, the first from Emily Couch, who's a program assistant uh, at the National Endowment for Democracy and our former uh, intern at the Kennan Institute. 
Uh, she asks about Mayor Sobyanin, who has been so much more visible in the media than Putin has. What's he up to? What's the goal? And then a related question uh, from Paul Holmes is, uh, is there a heightened potential for social and political uh, instability uh, also because of the falling uh, oil price uh, and the fact that the, the, the government can't buy off the population? Uh, but I would also, for you, Sergey, I would flip that on its head. People cannot protest in the streets, or at least they can't do it safely. So is maybe this also a boon for uh, authoritarian uh, control of the population? The police have a good excuse to force people indoors. Yeah, sure. Uh, Putin, in, in this case, in this particular thing, Putin was absolutely clear this Monday. And uh, he said uh, the possibility of make the, the mass uh, organiz organized uh, events will be the last we will open. <laughs> so, so, so uh, it's it, it sure it's a very important uh, situation, very important factor for Russian government now, this possibility to block all the social activity uh, first of all, the social activity on the streets of Russian, of Russian cities. So the, uh, all the events are moved uh, uh, on the on the uh, on the on the political uh, political tactics. Uh, uh, it's, it was a very good question about Sabianin. Sabian, Sabian is uh, quite visible now. Sabian is quite uh, active now, and Moscow is the city. Uh, uh, where uh, where the, the most of uh, uh, of contaminations and uh, most of deaths uh, are uh, now uh, in Russia more than ten thousand uh, uh, no no more than a half of all Russian uh, cases of uh, coronavirus are uh, now in Moscow and. Uh, 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 Sabianin is 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 uh, forced to act, and uh, uh, it's absolutely sure that uh, on the late period of uh, this uh, epidemic, and maybe just after this epidemic, we will see the uh, very difficult fighting before uh, between uh, Putin's uh, uh, and uh, uh, and Sabianin Sabianin team team, not because. Uh, Sabianian will try to be uh, on the place of Putin, but just uh, because Putin can't support the existence of another important figure, not an important personage, uh, uh, close to close to him, and uh, it's sure that Putin and his entourage will try to uh, to destroy this this new popularity of uh, of Sabian. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Um, one very quick final question, if I can, for you, uh, Judy. Um, you briefly mentioned the uh, impact of the COVID epidemic on women. This is a question from Inga uh, Plateus. Uh, there are reports of abortion services becoming inaccessible, uh, being deemed non-essential. Um, can you comment specifically about access to abortion services in Moscow and other regions of Russia during COVID? Yeah, thank you, Matt. The latest numbers I've seen is that there are as many as a million abortions that would normally have been performed in Russia during this time period that have not been so far. So this is a fundamental restriction of access to women's reproductive health services that will have health consequences for those women um, going forward. Of course, the state is interested in increasing birth rates, and so they may be happy to have a number of uh, additional babies being born, even if those are, are not necessarily wanted babies. Um, and very quickly to bring this back around to the question about, um, about civil activism and protests and mass protests, um, I wonder how much, not just in, the, in Russia, but in many countries around the world, we're going to see some innovation with social service, uh, civil society activism, and mass protest moving online. In other words, is this going to be a period of sort of dynamic innovation where people figure out how to do this kind of communication and have impact through this kind of mass communication um, through the channels that are available to them, uh, in this case, through, uh, through online communication? Yeah. 
Great. Um, well, uh, one really good example of both protest uh, and uh, impacts on women's health is the uh, hashtag Yanik uh, Khatela Umerat, which you can see on Twitter. It's women posting photos of themselves having been abused in these uh, social distancing lockdown conditions, which is unfortunately also an epidemic amid the pandemic. Uh, I want to thank all three of you, really just phenomenal complimentary perspectives on this ongoing problem. We'll continue to cover it. Uh, pay attention to the next episode of our Kenan X podcast, which is going to cover uh, Russia and COVID. Uh, thank you for all your excellent questions. So for now, uh, signing off. See you soon. Bye-bye.